everyone to what we found. Um, Narcisco uh, Garcia is not here yet, but we are, his, his assistant is saying he's, you know, running to get here. Uh, obviously, he's a, he's a practicing superintendent, so many things going on, but I uh, hope to be joined by him shortly. Uh, Stephanie Augenbaugh is a senior director of academic support at Upl Uplift Education. So pleased to have her today. And also Connor uh, Williams is a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. Uh, sort of a national expert uh, in English language learners and policies at the national and state level. So we're excited to have him here. Uh, we're also going to be joined towards the end of the pot, uh, the webinar by a student, uh, Gabrielle Machado, who's an 11th grader, and who's going to give us a little bit of background on what's it like to be in an EL program. He immigrated from uh, Brazil, and he's at Rembrandt Secondary School. So it'll be fun to get a student perspective at the end. So, Devin, I am going to start uh, with you, if you can share your screen and take us through some of the findings. Yeah, thanks, Amber. So, um, as Amber mentioned, I'm Devin Carlson. I'm an associate professor in the political science department here at the University of Oklahoma. And I, and I wrote this report with David Griffith at, at Fordham that's titled Charter Schools and English Learners in the Lone Star State. So I'm gonna give you a little background um, and a little motivation and then walk you through some of the findings. So as, as many of you may know, there has been a surge in the number of English learners in Texas over the last decade, from about 830,000 uh, in 2010, so a little more than 10 years ago, to more than a million today. And that growth has been even larger, even faster in the charter sector. Uh, a five, a quintupling of ELs in the charter sector between you know, 2010 and today, 25,000 to more than 120,000 today. And so with this growth of, of the EL population in Texas and then in the charter sp sector specifically, it really puts a premium on understanding the educational experience of these student groups and how this groups or how these students in, in the two sectors perform. And so it leads to three research questions. The first one being, how do the English learners who enroll in Texas charter schools compare to their peers in traditional public schools? The second one is how do the academic and ec economic outcomes of English learners in the Texas charter school sector compared to those of their peers in, in the traditional public schools? And then third, how have the academic outcomes evolved as the number of ELs and charters has, has increased over the years? And so the report goes in depth into each of these research questions, given you know, time constraints like Amber said, we have an hour. I'm gonna keep a more surface level presentation today, but I'm happy to discuss any of them in more detail. And just to give you a sense of the data that we used, um, we used administrative records from Texas starting in the early 2000s and extending over about 20 years up until today. And these records come from the Texas Education Agency, um, higher ed, institutions, the, the specifically the Higher Education Coordinating Board in Texas, and then the Workforce Commission is where we got our, our earnings records. So I'm going to dive right into the findings. So today, Texas charters enroll a disproportionate share of English learners in the state. So if you look back in the early 2000s, the average charter student attended a, a, a school where about 12 percent of students were ELs. That number was closer to 19, 18, 19% in traditional public schools. But today, the average charter student attends a school where about 28% are of their peers of the students in the school are ELs, compared to just over 20% in the traditional public sector. So you see that really the, the relationship has flipped over the last 20 years. And it's even more pronounced when we look at students who are ever classified as English learners. Today, about almost 40% or the average student in a charter school, uh, about 40% of their peers have at one time been, been an English learner. It's about 30% for students in the traditional public sector. So again, you've seen this really big change over the last 20 years in how in the composition of the two sectors with respect to English learners. This growth in the charter sector has been broad based. So what this figure shows you is the 45 degree line is equivalent shares of ELs in the charter and traditional public schooling sectors. So if it's above this 45 degree line, there are larger shares of ELs in the charter sector. If it's below, there are larger shares in the traditional public sector. This is what it looked like in 2005, where we had a handful of districts above that 45 degree line. 
Today, or in 2019, the last pre-pandemic year, we have a large number, a much larger number of districts, including some of the largest districts in the state, lying above that 45 degree line. So we see this, this shift towards the charter sector being relatively broad based. As this transition has occurred, as these changes have occurred, we have seen charters ELs becoming more similar to their TPS peers. So this is one graph that shows baseline English proficiency, uh, where the lightest shade is beginning, the lowest level of baseline proficiency, and the darkest shade is the highest level. And if you look back in the 2010 time period, you see much larger shares of EELs in the traditional public sector having beginning levels of baseline English proficiency compared to their peers in the charter sector. Over time, you've seen that those you've seen those numbers come closer to one another. So as the charter sector has become a more popular option for the English learner population in the state, you've seen the two populations come to represent or to come to look more like each other in terms of baseline English proficiency, baseline reading and math scores, home language, all sorts of other measures that are in the report. This is just what I'm going to show you today. So that leads to the question, okay, how, how are the two sectors faring in terms of achievement gains? Well, we see slightly higher gains in reading for ELs in the charter sector, but slightly less, slightly smaller gains in math. I want to highlight, though, I want to emphasize that these gains are not huge, right? We're not talking about massive differences. We're talking about a percentile here. So moving from the 40th percentile to the 41st, right? So we're not talking a massive difference in test score of gains, but they are worth noting. So reading, a small charter advantage, math, a small charter disadvantage in terms of test score gains. Now, related to that, potentially related to that, is the fact that we find charters reclassify English learners as English proficient more quickly than traditional public schools. So what this graph shows is years since initial enrollment, the blue line is the proportion of chartered ELs who are reclassified as fully proficient. The orange line is the proportion of, or the percent of traditional public schools. And so you see that every point over the first seven, eight years, the charter, uh, the charter line lying above the traditional public schooling line. And in, in further work that's not that I'm not going to show you, but it's in the report, we show that this is driven by charter schools reclassifying students who have the lowest levels of baseline English proficiency much more quickly. So their the charter schools are taking students who enter with relatively low English proficiency skills and moving them to proficiency more quickly than the traditional public sector. So those are the shorter term outcomes we looked at. Now, in terms of looking at longer term outcomes, we find that charter ELs are more likely to graduate high school. So we did this we, three different ways. We look at charter students who are enrolled in eighth grade compared to their peers in the traditional public sector enrolled in eighth grade, charter students enrolled in 10th grade, and then charter students enrolled in 12th grade. And for the eighth and 12th grade cohorts, we see about a five percentage point charter advantage. Um, in terms of graduating high school. The estimate is smaller, about a percentage point for 12th grade, but by the time that every student reaches 12th grade, everyone's highly likely to graduate, so you don't expect to see much difference there. So in addition to being more likely to graduate from high school, um, charter English learners are more likely to enroll in college as well. Uh, five percentage points for the eighth grade cohort compared to about eight percentage points and eight percentage points for the 12th grade cohort. It's worth noting that all of these differences are driven by a greater likelihood of enrolling in a four-year institution. There's really no difference in the likelihood of enrolling in a two-year institution. So these, the, the higher enrollment rates you see among charter ELs is driven by higher enrollment in four-year schools. And finally, we show that charter or ELs and charters are likely they on average earn more in the years after their college exit. So what we have here is the graph showing the expected year of high school graduation and ELs attending charters earn less by about 500 to $1,000 to until four or five years after high school graduation, which is the period that coincides with, with that high, those higher levels of college enrollment. But then you see the graph go above zero and by the time we're, you know, 10, 11, 12 years out, um, ELs who attended charter schools it earn about $1,500 to $2,000 more on average than their peers who attended traditional public schools. 
So coming to the end of my time here, I just want to highlight three takeaways that, that we made in the report. One is that charter schools in Texas seem to stack up pretty well against the traditional public sector in, in, terms, of, in terms of serving the state's English learners. Second, it's clear that longer term outcomes and examining those outcomes are essential to really understanding EL's educational experiences. We didn't see really see much difference in terms of test score gains, but we do see once you look at high school graduation, college enrollment, and those earnings outcomes, you see some different start, differences start to emerge. That said, you know, there might be some evidence that efforts to boost the English learner's reading achievement um, could be coming at the expense of, of math. You know, that additional time that might be spent during the school day getting ELs to be classified as fully English proficient might re result in lower, low, less time uh, devoted to math instruction. And so that's something that I think would be worth looking into further and keeping an eye on. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Amber. Awesome. Thank you, Devin. You right on time. I love it. Um, I am going to pivot to Stephanie because I want to hear um, Stephanie talk a little bit about ELL programming at Uplift, and maybe we'll try to put some of these findings in, in context on the ground. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Augenbaugh. As Amber mentioned, I'm the Senior Director of Academic Support for Uplift Education. Uplift Education is a network of 45 charter schools in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. If you're familiar with DFW, we have schools all the way from Old East Dallas into Stop 6 in Fort Worth into North Irving. So pretty geographically diverse across the Metroplex, and that brings with it um, some incredible language diversity to our school district. We have about 22,000 students. Um, our, our mission is 100% college acceptance for all and um, college completion. Um, as far as the way our programming for English learners work, about 8,000 of our students, so about a third of our students are English learners, which is a pretty tremendous percentage uh, even for within the state of Texas, right? Um, because of the geographical diversity, there are a couple of interesting dynamics at play in Uplift. And we have some schools where the student population is 75, 80% English learners. And we have other schools where the population is maybe only 10% English learners. We also have about 40 different native languages represented across our network, which is an amazing asset. Um, it's an amazing asset. It also makes our considerations for the programming we offer to our English learners um, just really nuanced. So Uplift has been around for just over 20 years. In those 20 years, we've offered an ESL model to our students. So our students enter the district, we identify them as English learners, we provide ESL services with the goal to exit those children as we can. Um, and one of the reasons we do that is because as opposed to perhaps um, our colleagues, perhaps in the Rio Grande Valley, like we, we don't just have two or three languages represented here. We have so many and we have to take that into consideration. Um, that being said, we are planning to implement um, dual language immersion programming if 15 months from now um, at some of our schools to specifically serve our schools with high um, Spanish language percentages there. Um, so we're in this place of like trying to figure out what is the best way to serve a really diverse school district, diverse school population, and also recognizing um, that Spanish language uh, is increasing within our district. Um, and I think something that we'll talk about a little bit later if we have an opportunity is just the incredible increase in our RAELs, our recently arrived immigrant English learners or our newcomers who tend to be coming to our schools um, from Spanish speaking countries. And that's something we have to consider as well, which is why we're moving into that dual language immersion programming. Um, but yeah, that's what English learner programming looks like at Uplift. I'm interested to hear how that may differ from other populations. We were chatting before the panel started about how we needed to norm on the terminology because it, the understanding of it just changes a little bit everywhere you go. Um, so I'm excited to have the opportunity to learn from my panelists today and to hopefully be able to answer some of your questions. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. I have just gotten word that Dr. Garcia's uh, right-hand person is going to be joining us soon. 
Um, so I'm going to pivot for a minute to you, Connor. Um, I'm interested in, because one thing that came up a lot was the fact that in order to have educational equity, and you've written about this uh, at length, we need more access to bilingual instruction, which requires that you have a more linguistically diverse teaching force. Um, and so I guess if you could just say a little bit more about what you think the federal government, the state government, uh, and other entities might be doing to help states and districts um, gain more access to um, bilingual teachers. Sure. Well, thank you first for having me uh, and for, for publishing this report. Uh, in my world, I think Texas gets undernoticed and underrated for the work that they're doing with English learners. Um, I think some of this is just political supposition. Uh, there are a lot of assumptions people make about the state of Texas for whether they're good reasons or not. But Texas enrolls more English learners in bilingual education than almost everybody else put together. I mean, it's something like 40% as of 2019 of their English learners were enrolled in either bilingual or dual settings, which is really impressive. And, and again, far ahead of every other state. Um, so beyond that, your, your question was about access to these programs. But as you said, we just actually put out a report at the Century Foundation um, a week ago today on uh, a national study we've been trying to get going on on this. So I won't plug my report at a different report uh, panel, but anybody who's interested, get in touch. Um, it really is the number one variable, right? That we cannot grow access to bilingual education or to dual language immersion programs without more linguistically diverse teachers. The numbers aren't ambiguous. Um, or you heard before, right? At least 10% of kids right now are currently classified as English learners in the United States. Another at least five or 10% of kids are former English learners who are linguistically diverse, speak another language at home and learn English at US schools and have since hit proficiency in English. The teaching force in the United States, it's nowhere near that as far as, as that level of diversity. We, we simply don't have that many folks who are multilingual who are in classrooms. And even of those multilingual teachers that we do have, we don't have many who are credentialed, trained, and actually working in bilingual settings. You know, if you're a native German speaker who teaches high school physics and English, then you're not going to help us solve our bilingual teacher shortage. So the big things that can we can do to alleviate this shortage, uh, start at the local level. There's there's a lot of interesting work to be done with grow your own programs where districts work with either local community colleges or, or regional universities to try to develop pathways that are non-traditional sometimes for uh, multilingual paraprofessionals or other multilingual staff in the district. There are, of course, then each of those kinds of grow your own or alternative certification programs or you know, complicated sort of mixes that are pathways that are some alternative and then also some through the traditional teacher training programs. Those also are going to have to work within state context. So state policies that um, allow for provision, provisional licensure for linguistically diverse teachers, that's another thing we can do. I mean, the, the easy example in this is, I'm never gonna forget this. I visited a, a dual language classroom, I won't say where, just say um, not too far from where I live here in DC, where this uh, administrator of this dual language school is showing us around. She points to a paraprofessional in the back of the classroom, says this lady uh, was a trained teacher in her native country uh, in, in Central America. She's been working here in our district, in our school for over a decade. She has all of the credentials she needs. She has even gotten them all transposed into the US system and she can't pass the teacher licensure exam in English. Now we don't need her to, to work in English. We are a fully bilingual staff and school. We can work in Spanish. We know that we want her at the front of the classroom and she's taken this you know, English language licensure exam like seven times at great cost, can't get over it. It's that kind of thing. States can do better on that. Uh, Puerto Rico has a teacher licensure exam that's, uh, you know, that's uh, equivalent to the praxis that could be used. There's lots of ways to be creative about this. Um, I, mean, I guess the last thing I would say on that is that we have a lot of evidence that the teacher training and licensure system that we use in the United States is, is mini, mediocre at guaranteeing higher quality instruction. But we have also significant evidence that it's really effective at reducing teacher diversity, including linguistic diversity. So if we have this marker for quality that isn't really a marker for quality, but it is preventing us from getting the workforce we need, it seems obvious that we should be working either to fix that or working around that. The last thing I'd say at the federal level, and we put out a report in December 2021 on this, um, well, on a number of things, but it was part of one of our recommendations, was that there, there's definitely room for the, the federal government to do greater investments in some of these things that I've, I've mentioned before, some competitive grant programs to encourage the development of bilingual teacher training pathways, things of that nature. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate that. Um, 
I think Abigail Hamilton is actually Jennifer Burden. Am I right on that? <laughs> yeah, correct. I don't know why I'm coming in as Abigail Hamilton, but nice name. Uh, I'm the bilingual ESL and dual language director for Vanguard Academy. Hello, everybody. I apologize. Hey, thank you for jumping in. I, I heard he was double booked and running around. So thank you, Jennifer, for being able to hop on. This We're is the real world of, of schooling. Yes, we're running dual language training right now, so you caught us here, so it's a good time. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, ask you what I asked Stephanie earlier, which is just to give us a little thumbnail sketch of what English learner programming looks like at Vanguard. What's your model or models and, uh, you know, any, any kind of uh, reasoning or rationale for why you guys went with that model? Okay, so while we are right on the uh, Mexican border, we are 50% emergent bilingual, um, and we are a relatively high-performing district. We do have the Gomez and Gomez dual language uh, model up to the third grade. Uh, we are going on up to the fourth grade uh, this year, and we're actually doing training. We actually have a professor from UTRGV, so I better not get anything wrong. No pressure, she's here. <laughs> but uh, we do, uh, we are really focused on developing biliteracy. Um, and our goal is eventually to move the dual language program all the way up to the 12th grade. Um, we do, um, yeah, we do implement with fidelity because we do want our students, because we have such a high um, emergent bilingual population, uh, we do want to make sure that they are really on grade level and beyond with their content and literacy skills um, before the dual language program and up uh, next year up to the fifth grade, well, just fifth grade only, we have the transitional bilingual early exit, which really is not the best model, um, but that is what we do have in place. At secondary, we have ESL pullout. Um, that's how the students are coded um, because the English teacher is an ESL uh, certified teacher. So in secondary, that's how they're coded, but we're very focused on sheltered instruction and content-based language instruction as well at the secondary. I don't know if that answered your question, I hope. You're muted, Miss. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, Jennifer. I was trying to track all that. Um, I got the ESL pullout. Um, I got the the limitations of transitional. I guess just one question. It piggybacks on the discussion we were just having. Uh, I mean, are you guys having difficulty as well in terms of recruiting bilingual teachers, or because of your population, do you have a less of of an issue there? Well, you know, I do attend all the bilingual director meetings. I'm also um, active with RGB Thave, so I am aware of what's going on in the state with the recruitment of uh, bilingual uh, teachers. It is a challenge. We did have to put a couple of teachers on waivers, uh, but it is comparatively less. You know, I, I heard, I think it was this last week, I heard that Dallas ha is needing 200 plus uh, bilingual uh, certified teachers in kindergarten. So <laughs> that's and crazy to me. You know, we need, I think, 13 district wide, all the different grade levels. But um, in having those conversations, I know that they're looking at legislation to perhaps um, improve the way we are testing these teachers. Um, I know I'm I'm married to a, uh, somebody who is bilingual, bilingually certified. Well, he's a dual language teacher at the high school level, actually. But he could pass the BLPT. Um, without a problem, but he couldn't pass uh, sections of the bilingual test. And it's not content knowledge necessarily. It's just that, you know, his native language is Spanish. So he, and he has a master's degree, by the way, in statistics from this country, but he does struggle with that standardized uh, testing language uh, at that very high level. So um, I know that they are proposing some legislation now to let people test in certain areas. So they wouldn't have to take the whole test again. It would just be in the different competencies where they were lacking. Yeah, that, that actually uh, underscores what Connor was saying earlier. Um, I guess just to, to get everyone in here for a minute, um, I was, was just curious, you know, I, I feel like there, when we were doing the study, something we heard from our interviewers, our interviewees was just, again, this, you know, the access problem that, that it seemed like everyone would like a dual immersion program if they could have a dual immersion program. 
Um, I know that there's been some research on dual immersion that's fairly promising, but I guess in my mind, uh, you know, the, the, the definition is you're half in English or half in another language. Like, what does that really look like? I mean, half and half. It's like, is it certain days you're speaking one language and certain days you're speaking another? Is it by subject? Or I guess, you know, from someone who, you know, hasn't been in, in the, on the ground and looking at what a dual immersion program looks like, I guess if you guys could talk from your own experience, if not in your own schools and others. So, you know, I'm not the expert here. I think we're a few years behind Jennifer's schools where we're um, we're planning to implement this soon. But I think like, I mean, you can talk all you want about the percentages of instruction and how things are labeled in the classroom and all of that sort of stuff. But I think the benefit of it, in my mind, is that you are endorsing for the students in your classroom, for the families that they support, that like there are multiple avenues through which to learn the same content and that all of those are valid and good, right? Um, I, I was a teacher in a dual language program in, in Dallas ISD. That was that was quite a while ago. But when I was a teacher in a dual language program, I was a fifth grade math teacher. So by the time students came to me, their math instruction was all in English. And my students' literacy and social studies um, instruction was in Spanish. And that, you know, that's a progression from where they start in pre-K or kindergarten, which is probably something Jennifer could speak about a little bit. But like what I would just emphasize for schools, for stakeholders on the line, um, being biliterate, being bilingual, or in many cases, I saw someone asked in the chat, why don't we use the terminology emerging bilingual? Well, because in many cases, it's our student's third or fourth language that they're learning, right? Just that language diversity is such... Um, is such an opportunity and it's just a way to access information differently and it provides you so many different schemas that you come with, right? So I think the beauty of a dual language immersion program is explicitly endorsing that and supporting it and then lining up the mechanisms to match that. Like, for example, your students might get to take STAR in their native language, Um that's great. Like I, I'm, I'm happy to see that, but I, none of us teach us because we want kids to do well on STAR, right? We, we teach because we want them to be critical thinkers. And one way to do that is provide them with like multiple languages that they can use to access content. But yeah, curious to see what my peers say who are a little bit more well-versed in that programming. So um, I'm actually, my background before I, I came on board with Vanguard is I did come from a large dual language district that had been doing it for 20 years. And I was doing it at the high school level. Um, I'm, I'm doing a doctorate right now in literacy. And I can tell you that um, when you look at dual language programming and the why, you really need to look at, at what the student is going to deal with as they move up in the grades. Uh, you know, I... I, I feel like we, you know, the, we use a, like a 90, 10 model, uh, up to the, well, up to the second grade, it changes, right. And Gomez and Gomez, but we really want those students to have, <laughs> excuse me, that very, very strong, uh, foundational level in, in, in content, but in reading as well, you know, because, uh, I, I have seen students because I was a Dean at a high school that had, 800 emergent bilinguals in a large public high school. And I will tell you that it is very difficult to work with long-term emergent bilinguals who do not have, did not have the benefits of, of uh, getting a good foundation in their native language. You know, there, there's unfortunately remediation. There's, you know, you, I, I actually encourage you to do something. Um, go ahead and look at the state uh, and look at your own districts at your taper reports. Um, we look a lot at STAR, but I encourage you to look at what's going on with your EBs and TSI in uh, dual credits. Um, and also look at, there's another indicator, I can't remember, it's in CCMR, it's the one for the uh, HB5 classes, you know, the classes where the kids can't pass TSI, so they take that additional class. The emergent bilinguals are way overrepresented there. So what is that saying about uh, what we're doing and servicing these kids? You know, we obviously need to set them up for success. 
And so if they are not able to read on grade level, if they're not able to keep up and um, eventually hopefully outperform their peers, which would be expected if they're very strong biliterate students, we're really going to be hurting economically as a state in the future. So you guys, this is coming up in the in the uh, Q and A, but I also had planned to ask you about it as well. Um, and the question is, you know, if we think, you know, we, we've seen a, a big difference in the number of uh, families of uh, of ELs going to charter schools comparatively uh, to the to the district. And and the question is whether we think that parents may be attracted to charter schools for some reason, or is it that the policies that are affecting teachers and students in these programs are different between the charter and traditional sectors? And, and specifically, does, do the charters have any more flexibility when it comes to teacher certification or, or waivers about that? Or, or is it your understanding that the policies for the charter and district sector are the same? And, and if that's the case, then how do you explain maybe a, a relative increase in the charter sector versus the traditional sector? So Jennifer and I, I feel confident speaking for her, would both love to tell you that we are subject to all of the same restrictions and accountability outcomes as traditional public schools, but we are funded at about $900 less per student than traditional public schools. Um, you know, I, I personally, I'm really in favor of school choice. Probably many of us on the call today are. I think the feedback we get from, from our families, and that's all I can it can really speak to, but the feedback we get from our families, our emerging bilingual families, is that college access and college completion is a huge priority for them. We especially hear that from our REL, from our newcomer families. Um, and I think we, we should be providing choices for our families in the community, and that's exactly what Uplift tries to do in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We have some great comprehensive high schools around us that offer wonderful athletic programs, or there are some ISDs that have um, partnerships with community colleges that provide the associate's degree alongside the high school diploma. And I think those are great choices that families should have. What we have found is that those, those do not correlate to four-year college completion those do not correlate to a bachelor's degree. And that's what our emerging bilingual families tell us that they care about. And so a charter school district with um, a rigorous international baccalaureate curriculum is something that better meets their needs if, if their family's goal is college completion for their students. I don't, there was an interesting question in the chat about like, do we have flexibility in the way that we identify our English learners? That's, there, we definitely don't have the flexibility. It's an interesting question about the resources that a school district may choose to provide to the team that does the identification. I know that um, at my school district, we, I mean, we really make a huge push at the beginning of the year, including home visits. Um, and that, like, that's something that my district has chosen to prioritize with our budget. I don't know if that's the case elsewhere, but that's an interesting wondering. I can't speak anywhere near as authoritatively at the, the state level or the local level to this, but I will say that to your part of the question around the why of choice for English learners and their families in charter schools, there's actually a, a significant gap in the research. The best studies I've seen on this are from uh, a woman named um, uh, Dr. Mavro Gordato out of Michigan State University. Uh, and I think also, uh, I want to say Rebecca Callahan out of the UT Austin has also done some, but the short of what we found in, in the limited studies we have are that, um, in most places, this is this study being an exception to this rule. In most places, English learner families tend to make lesser use of school choice mechanisms, be they charters or in district or what have you, than non-English learner families. Uh, the assumption generally on this and what little research we have suggests that this is usually a function of some linguistic barriers that a lot of choice systems have not been set up to be uh, authentically accessible to families who don't speak English at home or speak English as a native matter, uh, but also a lot of cultural uh, familiarity and, and sort of cultural capital elements too, that a lot of school choice for English learner families comes through social networks. And if social networks that they're part of don't um, aren't plugged into the full range of choice options within a district or districts and charters or, or fill in the blank, then they, they lack some of the informational access they might otherwise have. Um, 
So the only thing I can say that because we see, I mean, and and uh, Dr. Carlson's study shows, right, that there's been a disproportionate increase in in EL enrollment in in uh, Texas charter schools, is that it is worth noting that Texas is a bit of an outlier here. This is a state where over a third of the families in the state speak a non-English language at home. It is a functionally almost a bilingual state and society. And in certain cities, it's, it truly is. I mean, San Antonio, last I saw, was about half and half, uh, Spanish dominant at home, English dominant at home. And then if you assume some cross-pollination, Spanish dominant families that have strong English in the home, English dominant families that speak significant amounts of Spanish, it could be that some of the choice networks and the cultural capital that goes with that, that if you're a Spanish dominant family, recent arrivals in Texas, getting access to or knowing about the charter options might come sooner than it would in Minnesota. And just to add to Connor's point, I think part of it might also be driven by where the charter sector expansion has occurred in Texas. It's occurred uh, disproportionately in, in areas with high levels of linguistic diversity. You're not seeing a lot of charters in the Panhandle or in West Texas comparative to the major uh, urban areas of the state. I'm also going to state that I think part of the reason why they are so popular is that charters tend to be smaller, right? So we are, uh, you know, when you talk about servicing emergent bilinguals, uh, a lot of times in bigger systems, uh, it tends to be kind of a blanket approach. So everyone gets this sort of uh, support, everyone um, gets this kind of accommodation, whatever, right? But when you look at a charter, because we're smaller, we're looking at the kids more intentionally one-on-one. -on -one. And as a result, that's why they're successful. And so success breeds uh, more students, I guess. Uh, and, and it's really because we are so intentional with one-on-one -on -one because of size. I'm looking again at some of the questions coming through in the Q&A. And, &A. and um, one is just, you know, wanting to hear more about, you know, and, and we see this a lot just in terms of the promising practices you've learned in your own school or district or from other folks in, in, in the uh, EB area. Um, there's this reference to using, you know, ESSER and title funds to accelerate multilingual learner outcomes and the push to do that. And so I guess if you guys have any, you know, our, 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 our folks want to hear some details, you know, we, I know we throw away, throw around these terms a lot, um, but what is it, what, what do you think really works and is promising um, for, for these, for these groups, groups of kids? I'll name uh, three things that I think uplift as well here. First one is um, a position we have in the district that's an ESL interventionist and um, where I see really great traction there is specifically our ESL interventionists in our high school classrooms and their side-by-side -side support in our English one classrooms. And um, so what does it look like to have the gen ed ESL supplemental certified teacher sitting side-by-side -side the ESL interventionist and planning uh, that classwork? Um, so I think that's been one staffing strategy that's been really successful. Um, another thing, so I, we all know that in Texas, we have um, some summer school requirements for our youngest English learner um, students. That for Uplift has been a really successful program in terms of our summer school program. We probably get the most bang for a buck out of that in terms of like growth and where those students enter the following school year. So this year we're adding a high school version of that. Um, it's it's language development for our high school kiddos. It we have plenty of students entering our network in the sixth or the ninth grade, especially, uh, and we just thought we might see if we can duplicate some of that success there. And um, so that's certainly a use of title funds. And then the third thing is more of like an organizational thing. Um, I know that at lots of districts, particularly more traditional. Uh, districts that have been around for a while, the English learner programming team sits on the administrative team or sometimes the compliance team. And what we did four years ago was we moved that team out of the compliance arm of our org chart 
into our academic programming art. So they now sit side by side with our curriculum team. And that means when I sit down weekly with our president, um, with our CEO, and we look at data, we are looking like we are specifically pulling out what does our EL data look like um, on, on the various metrics that we're examining that week. So part of it is just you know, structurally, where does your staff sit and what sort of training and development do they get? That might be something folks can think about. I would also say because we are schools of choice, we do have uh, parental involvement quite a, it's, we are very strong with parental involvement. Something that uh, I think is, I don't know yet. I mean, we're getting the scores as we speak, right? But uh, something that I think has been so incredibly profound that we did, first of all, we did uh, hire bilingual uh, or dual language strategists um, through our Title III funds. So you can do that with Title III. Um, and we put them under Title III specifically because that means they're instructional. That's all they do, and they must service only emergent bilinguals. So we really worked very, uh, they work very closely with the teachers, but we also worked with the parents and the students because I, we don't just focus on assessment, of course, but at some point we do need to talk about that, you know, and we really were uh, very intentional about talking to students and to their parents about why they were taking an assessment how they were taking an assessment, what supports they were getting, and how it connected, because we we're also an early college uh, district. So, you know, I'm a third grader. Why does this matter to me? And um, what is the end goal? Because we do, you know, the one of the things that I think we fail to do quite a bit, but we are really improving on, is uh, under Title III, you have to do a parental as well. So uh, your parents may not be very familiar with what an early college program is. They may not know what um, like FAFSA is and, and, and post-secondary. So we really wanted to make those connections and I think it's really paying off. That's great. Um, I appreciate those, those concrete um, strategies. I want to just spend a few minutes and get Gabriel Machado in here. I see the name. Uh, Gabriel is a, a student in 11th grade. He's at Rembrandt Secondary School, um, immigrated from Brazil, and is participating uh, in, in the EL program. Gabriel, welcome. Um, I just want to ask you, you know, you're, 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 this is not to be overwhelming to you, but um, we'd love to just hear a little bit about what's been useful to you as you've tried to, you know, gain gain proficiency in the English language, if there are things that teachers did or the school did to, uh, to that you found useful. I feel that something that helped me a lot in learning English and school subjects at the same time was the support and help from the teachers. I know that for them it was not easy having to teach 20 students and answering their questions and thoughts. At the same time, they were also helping me with the system I needed. I feel that thanks to their efforts in explaining the material to me and their desire for me to succeed, it was extremely important and this is it for me to reach more levels. As a student who had to learn English in school context at the same time, I could say that based on my experience before learning the language itself, it's also necessary for the student who is learning English to be understood first. And for that, I think that the student need to be comfortable and confident to communicate and also be able to obtain a good learning and continue with good habits. Uh, preferably, I believe that starting a conversation with the student in their original language, if possible, about their life, their interests, their customs, and their goals before the beginning of the learning itself can be very beneficial to contribute to the process the student is going through. I also think that understanding how the student's life was in the past and their relationship with school can also serve to start a good relationship between teaching English and the school subjects for them. I say this because I was in Brazil, I lived there for 13 years, and it was extremely complicated when I had to change schools, country, and I also had to learn both English and Spanish at the same time, because my first language is Portuguese. And besides, in Brazil, I only studied there four hours a day, and here study eight, so it's a whole different thing. I, I also believe that understanding the students' way of learning subjects and the language, whether in a more rhetorical or practical way, 
helps in various internal and mental aspects, which is extremely important in process taking through their learning. So Gabriel, I think what I heard you say, especially at the beginning, and thank you so much, that was hugely helpful, is that it's important to establish a relationship with, with a teacher in your home language, right? To get to know each other first, to find out who you are as a person, not just, you know, I need to learn this language, but just developing a, a relationship so that you can work together. Uh, is, is, that, is that a decent um, summary of what, what you've shared, exactly. how important that is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how long have you been in your program now? Um, I started here on Finger in 2019, so approximately four years. Okay. Okay. That's great. Well, ha hey, I think you're doing phenomenal. So, so you're saying that you knew very little English when you came, and now you're talking to a panel of, of, uh, of experts <laughs> uh, across the country. That's phenomenal. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. Um, Stephanie or or Jennifer, any any comments based in, in relation to what Gabriel shared or what what resonates with you in terms of working with these students? Mike, Gabriel, tell them about uh, Tabe, well, the, about your essay that you wrote. I think that would be very important here. He actually won an award uh, for the region. So just tell them a bit about that. Okay, so... Uh... On October, my Spanish teacher showed me an, an essay contest from Tabby uh, talking about the students made, making an essay about their second language. I find it interesting, I started doing the essay, not expecting to something happen, but three months later on January, the, I, they gave me the result that I won the essay. I was not expecting that because I was thinking about a lot of things and I was extremely busy. But when they gave me the answer that I, I won, I I don't even have words to say. I, I was extremely, I have a lot of emotions going on. <laughs> what, was, what was the essay about, Gabriel? It was an essay talking about uh, the, exp uh, the experience and the change from one country to another and how to transition off languages. No, oh, very good. You know, I would awesome. just jump in and say that, like, Gabriel is like, I mean, all our faces light up hearing from Gabriel, right? Like, we are all in this because we know that our students are so smart and so hardworking. I have an incredible staff that I get to work alongside every day. I, like, what I would say to the folks on the call is that, like, I need help. I need help making sure that the folks that are so capable of doing this work are not stopped by red tape and bureaucracy and are ready to sit in our schools and work alongside our children. I don't know what that means from a credentialing or certification or teacher pipeline uh, perspective, but like I, I need help getting teachers from Brazil, Portugal, Somalia, Kenya, Northern India, and Pakistan. Like that would do that would make such a difference for the children in our state. They're, they're doing, they're just brilliant. Um, and like, we, we just can't do it with the folks that we have on hand who are so hardworking. Any other thoughts about um, policies or what would help? You know, I, I know Connor, you've written also about you know, just a, as basic as data collection, that we're not collecting good data to even know how we can better address the needs of these kids. I, I think if you could talk about that for, for a couple minutes and, and anything else you'd like to bring up on the policy or, or data front in terms of how we can address some of these needs that both Stephanie and, and Jennifer are, are bringing to the fore here. Sure. Uh, a couple of things. One, and it, it's kind of a long play, so it wouldn't help Stephanie uh, or Jennifer in the short term, but, but one thing that I think we haven't had enough conversation about the gap in teacher diversity to student diversity, you know, people say it, but one thing that would be, I think, a valuable sort of a soft power move policy-wise, wouldn't cost much, would be to ask as a matter of Title I that uh, states start publishing teacher diversity statistics on their, their report cards for the state. Because then you'd see right there, you know, that growing percentage of English learners, growing percentage of students of color, you know, an 87% white and 94% English dominant teaching force, right? Like that would start to like hammer home why of all of this. How you solve it then, 
it's going to be different for different states. There's going to be lots of different ways, but just clearing up for everybody what exactly the data gaps are would help. Another data policy, because we just did this report a week ago or published it a week ago on access to dual immersion in, in uh, different communities around the country, states are out of compliance on some basic uh, ESSA requirements around um, what data they publish. You know, I won't name names, but a couple of states we were engaging with weren't willing or able to share um, for free, at least publicly available data on school level English learner counts. They just decided they weren't going to publish those. And I live and work in DC and you're this close to the federal government. You don't get to just decide that's a law. You have to do it. So, so that, I mean, the last thing I would say, well, I'm, I'm riffing a little here is not data related, but I want to echo some of the answers to the ESSER question. The reason that dual immersion works so well and that bilingual works, uh, it doesn't mean you only can get the job done those ways. And here's what I, I want to explain. The reason that those things are such valuable pedagogical approaches for, for English learning students is that they, they really check two key boxes. One, they're really effective at pushing oral language development, right? Where if a child comes to school and has academic instruction and even social life happening in their home language, they continue to develop in their home language, which makes it, it's like learning to play the piano. If you learn to play it really, really well, picking up the violin gets a lot easier. The better you understand language in general or music in general, the better you can add that second language, that second in instrument. So that's one. Dual language programs mean that you can continue your academic and linguistic development as seamlessly as possible. And two, they do an excellent job of, of linking together um, the, well, I sort of already mushed these two. I was going to say social and academic uh, uh, life and then academic and linguistic development, sort of these two different things that work really well. So I've already kind of said them all in, in one. But the other thing I'd say is that this is possible within ESL programming too. So if let's say you're in a super diverse charter uh, district, and I, I heard that mentioned already, or in a, a district with 17 home languages in every elementary school and dual immersion just really isn't feasible, it is the case that if you can find ways to link closer your ESL development, your ESL coursework with the academic instruction that's happening, that's going to help too. Anything that brings uh, integration of academic content and linguistic development, and also anything that brings together native speakers of multiple languages so that the social life of the school isn't separated out. I mean, in other words, the worst way to do this the thing you should always avoid is ESL language done in a vacuum out in a hallway somewhere, whereas one ESL teacher and a handful of students, none of whom speak English as a native matter, that's, that's what to avoid. So I happen to be a partisan for dual language immersion. I think it's the best way to do it. The research backs that up. But, you know, tomorrow, a lot of kids are going to go to schools where that's not feasible. So that's the other thing. It's just as a matter of priorities, keep thinking of ways to bring academic development and linguistic development together and bringing English learners and English dominant kids together. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes left. I'm going to try to squeeze in one last, what I hope is a simple question, uh, which is how are ELs identified in Texas? Is it just a matter of you get a certain score? on your English language proficiency test, or is this kind of like a, a spaghetti bowl of, of things that, that you look at uh, in terms of uh, identifying the kids? So um, the wonderful thing, you know, about Texas is we have something called txel.org. And I encourage everyone to that save me as a director. And that really helps me uh, yeah, you're laughing because it's true. <laughs> um, and it and it has rubrics in there and everything for uh, implementing all programs with fidelity, all models. But in there, there is a video that actually parents don't understand that it begins with a home language survey. And then we we test them to identify. So uh, that I think, you know, it, it starts with the home language survey in Texas, right? Um, but a lot of times parents they don't understand what they're signing. So now uh, TA through Texel has included a document about the rights of parents to have the home language survey and the implications of the home language survey explained to them. So if you are getting the kids or parents to sign those without explaining it to them, you're out of compliance actually. It, it really is actually astonishing at the national level this is baseline civil rights obligations that you have to translate and interpret school communications to families. The lack of compliance on that just very low hurdle across the country is astonishing. And I would also say that that is just one small example of where like red tape and bureaucracy gets in the way. So like 
whatever software your district uses for enrollment at the beginning of the year, if they're only providing that in like Mandarin, Spanish, and English, it that's not enough. And that's like a place where like, it's really a technical thing, but it's a barrier. It's a barrier for our parents and there have to be ways to get past that. So the Texel website, that video, uh, it provides it in all of the languages. So, you know, if, if you cannot explain it in Urdu, for example, you will be able to show them that parents need to understand their rights and why they're signing something and what are the benefits actually of having their child in that program if they are identified as such, because there's huge benefits for having your child in, in bilingual programming. You guys, I've got two o'clock and wow, what a phenomenal panel. We packed in so much good information and, um, and insights. Stephanie, Connor, Devin, Jennifer, Gabriel, Abigail, thank you guys so much. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope we can continue the conversation in some facet in the future. Thank you guys. Thank you.